research reveals that one in seven girls say they have been sexually assaulted by a peer, meaning that another student or group of students has forced a sexual act upon them. Now, if you have any questions about how to address school violence or you're wondering how to talk to your own child about this, we want to help answer some of those questions. So what we're doing here on CBC News Network, plus welcome to our viewers on CBC News' YouTube page, as well as Marketplace's Twitter and Facebook accounts, you can submit questions on Facebook or by tweeting at CBC Marketplace. You can also join in with the live chat on YouTube. So. It's not just going to be me. We're going to have some experts answering these questions. Joining me now is Marketplace host David Common and Karen Kennedy. She's the president and CEO of Boost Child Youth Advocacy Center. Both of them joining us from Toronto. Thanks for joining us, guys. Okay, so while we wait for some of our viewer questions to come in and concern parents to start talking, let's first get David talking. David, you really took the lead in this investigation along with the producers. What were some of the things that really stood out for you as you were moving forward in the investigation? Yeah, absolutely, Natasha. You know, this was the result of a large-scale survey, groundbreaking survey involving 4,000 students coast to coast, really looking at what the experiences of 14 to 21-year-olds had been through those elementary, middle, and high school years, particularly when it comes to physical and sexual violence, looking also at some of the comments, whether it was homophobia or racist comments that they experienced. Bullying was not the sole focus, though certainly plays into quite a bit of this. And Natasha, you know, when I look at some of the things, I know a lot of people People are commenting on a story we have up today at cbcnews.ca about one in seven young women uh, reporting some of the most egregious forms of sexual assault, particularly forceful acts carried out against someone's will by um, another student. And, and Karen Kennedy with um, the Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Services, when you hear that kind of a number, does it surprise you? No, unfortunately it doesn't surprise me. We hear about these situations all the time. And so what, what can parents do if they worry that something is going on? How would you find out from your child if, you're, if, if your child is not coming forward to mom or dad directly about sexual touching, unwanted uh, harassment, or, or something even more serious and egregious? Mm -hmm. Well, we want kids to tell. We want them to feel that there are adults that they trust that they can talk to. If a parent suspects that something has happened and their child isn't willing to tell them, then give your child the message they can talk to somebody else. If you don't feel comfortable talking to me, talk to someone else that you trust. But if something's going on, really it's important to talk about it. Another trusted adult who could be in the family, in the community, a guidance counselor, a teacher, someone like that you're Absolutely. talking about. Absolutely. And, and, and the idea of um, physical violence is another one uh, that uh, really takes hold. Um, we have seen significant numbers of, of physical violence being reported by students. What are some tactics for people who are on the receiving end of that violence to be able to keep themselves safe? Yeah, again, the most important thing is to tell someone if something is happening to you. If people don't know what's going on, then they can't do anything about mm -hmm. it. So while we tell kids it's up to the adults to protect them, it's the adult's job to keep them safe, not the child's job, they do need to tell someone if they have a concern or a problem with something, and the adults need to listen and act on that. Mm -hmm. Natasha Fata, I know you, you're watching the social media feeds and you are bringing up some questions already. That's right, David. So Mark Jordan wrote to us on Twitter and he's saying, what exactly is behind the very real culture of secrecy and silence, he says, at all schools and school boards? Is it something about self-preservation? Is it so a blemish isn't on the school's record? Does it affect funding? What would be the motivation for schools to not take more aggressive mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. on this? So I'll translate that question for Karen coming in um, from someone watching on the social media streams right now uh, around something that we found in the data work done by uh, our investigative team that three quarters of the schools in Ontario, for instance, did not report a single incident of any kind, though they are legally required to do so. And there was this sense perhaps that maybe schools aren't reporting this, aren't coming forward with the, the information and aren't keeping track. What, what is the effect of something like that if we don't have a good picture of what's going on? And what does it mean in terms of our ability to stop these kinds of behaviors? Right. Well, I, I expect that's true, that schools aren't reporting, and there's probably a number of reasons. One is because kids aren't telling. Um, so encouraging kids in schools to talk about their problems, whether it's to a teacher or, mm -hmm. uh, or a parent, is the first thing. But maybe the schools aren't taking it seriously. Maybe the schools really need to listen to the kids and to act on this. You have to have a culture in a school where everybody feels safe and respected. And the schools should, from the 
very first day a child enters the school system be conveying that message that they're going to be safe, they're going to be listened to, they're going to be believed, and they're going to be protected. Natasha Fata, another question coming in on our social media feeds. That's right. This is from Carlene Conkin on Facebook, and she says, how about calling it for what it is instead of covering it all up by calling it bullying? She says, when it's technically assault in a majority of the cases, she says, I'm tired of schools trying to cover it up as it's something lesser, something that's called bullying, but they don't do that and they can't deal with it. What, what exactly is the rationale there? So, yeah, this is uh, the idea around what is the rationale, uh, as you say, Natasha, from uh, this this comment coming in, um, for for covering it up, covering up particularly bullying and not taking action. Do you see that in schools in your work, and and what ought to be done differently? We do see that sometimes, and I think it's because the school really doesn't want to acknowledge that they have a problem, mm -hmm. um, because they may be concerned about how they're going to be perceived by the community, by the parents. But actually, it's it's a much more important thing to take action and to do something and acknowledge that yes there are things that are happening and we need to change this nobody can do it on their own it's up to the school it's up to the parents it's up to the whole community to work together to create that kind of environment where kids are safe of course there'll be people watching who are in the middle of this with their son or daughter and feel like they have reached out to the school but haven't got anywhere so I would say the same thing to them that we say to kids, keep telling. So if the school isn't responding, then go to your trustee, go to your MPP. Keep telling and talking about it until action is taken. Natasha, I know uh, questions are coming in fast and furious. You've got another one. That's right. Maxine Adam on Facebook says, so all of those anti-bullying, pink shirt days, the talks, she says they've done nothing, have they? Bullying is even more rampant and vicious. Why is that? For start, there is no discipline or rules in the schools. That's according to her. Is there detention, suspension? What does that do to any, for anyone? Yeah, and, and a very good question about whether bullying, in fact, has gotten worse over recent years, why it has, and, and what sort of different sanctions, what kind of different approaches can be done to tackle it. I think from our experience it seems to have gotten worse. There seems to be just a, a higher level of violence. What that's attributable to, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a number of things. Um, violence in our community seems to be on the rise. So I think in terms of tackling it, schools need to, again, create those cultures, create those environments, let students know this is going to not be tolerated. Um, I think, you know, as students, Kids have a, uh, an expectation that the school is going to keep them safe. Nobody should feel afraid to go to school. And parents have an expectation that the school is going to keep their kids safe. So talk to your school about how they do that. Understand right from the beginning of the year, what are the policies? What is the practice around bullying? How will it be handled? And Natasha, I think these are things certainly that resonate uh, with, with all of us, with you and I, whether we have kids or not, they remember our own experiences. Um, and, and, and those experiences are also being shared certainly by you out in the audience today. More questions certainly coming in as well. Okay, so we've got another question coming in from Facebook. This is from Dave Chenier who says he's watching the story closely, wondering how much smartphones in every child's hands has contributed to this problem. Kids all seem to want notoriety through social media. This is, this is really a, a gets at the heart of the matter, Natasha, and I'm glad we're seeing a question around the effect of social media and the amplifying effect that it may be having um, on, on not just bullying, but the potential for physical violence. We've seen quite a few fights, really attacks, unprovoked sometimes, that are being captured on cell phone video. Nobody doing anything other than filming it. Yes, yeah, social media has actually contributed quite a lot to this issue. And I think it, it gives kids a way to participate um, anonymously sometimes without feeling like they're doing anything wrong. And that's, that's simply not true. So I think, you know, we need to understand what kids are doing on social media. Um, but it really goes back to creating that culture of respect and um, kindness and, and, you know, looking at things in a way that uh, prevents these things from happening in the first place. Natasha. Okay, another question coming in from Facebook from Kimberly Dunfield who says, who do you contact if the school board is doing nothing? Who d that is a very good question because we have repeatedly, repeatedly here heard in our survey, three out of five young people said that they did not report incidents, whether it was physical or sexual violations to their school board, but that even those who did, a large number of them were not satisfied, fully satisfied by the way that the school board dealt with it. And so what do you do if you are 
left unsatisfied, left perhaps not feeling protected by your school or school board. Right, well I, th I think you have to demand that they do protect you and that they do listen and take it seriously. And that means parents getting involved. And I think it means training for teachers and training for school administrators to understand how to handle these problems. You know, there's often an inclination to bring the child who's being bullied and the bully in a room together and sit them down. That's often not the right thing to do. But I think mm -hmm. schools don't necessarily have um, the expertise or the tools that they need to be able to deal with these situations and they need to also be communicating to parents what the parent and what the child can expect from the school. And Natasha of course we're going to be able to continue this conversation on on social media. Um, I imagine you're continuing to see more questions that are coming in. We are, but we are going to leave the conversation at this point, David, and we're going to leave it at least on CBC News Network. You two will continue the conversation online. So again, if you have any questions you'd like to submit, you can do so at CBC News' Facebook page. You can also tweet everyone directly at CBC Marketplace or just join the live chat on Marketplace's YouTube channel. All right, we are going to uh, continue the conversation here on our various social media platforms. We're going to broaden out our discussion as well because we do have Karen Kennedy, who is the president and CEO of Booth Child and Youth Advocacy Center. And you're certainly someone who can talk about these levels of physical and sexual violence that we've seen recorded in our survey. But Valerie Roulette was instrumental um, in that survey, has been involved in this project for months, has a deep understanding of, of the survey data, but also the kind of barriers that the investigative team face and I think it's a good opportunity to bring you in on that conversation about yeah. briefly what were the barriers that you saw from school boards? Well there were so many challenges with this. Like, first of all in all of Canada the reporting requirements are wildly different. Some places make it mandatory to report and have a system that's a little bit more structured where they compile the same things and define violence really clearly and then there's other provinces and territories where it seems to be up to every school principal to decide is this violence am I going to report it so as my job as a data journalist is to put together a big picture nationally that was impossible and we saw that really quickly and when it came to school boards we were seeing two types of reactions first of all there was a lot of what we call reputational risks yeah. so schools that it seemed either were telling us clearly or not so clearly that they were really afraid of how this data or these figures would reflect on their reputation. And then we were also seeing a lot of schools that didn't quite know how to produce this information for us, which tells us that maybe they don't look at it very often. Lots of questions still coming in on our social media streams, be it YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. Um, but I want to get to some of the questions because they're coming in quickly. Jewel Bale is asking, why don't schools teach kids not to harass others? Kids have a hard time talking to adults, even if they trust them. How can adults teach kids to simply not harass others? Great question. We have programs that we deliver in schools beginning in grade two that teach children um, about primary prevention. So it teaches them respect, it teaches them communication, self-esteem, um, and how to get help if you need it. I think every student in every school in the country mm -hmm. um, needs to have that kind of information. And then we build on that over the years. So that information isn't just delivered once, it's, it's over um, weeks and months and years reinforcing those messages to children. Uh, another question is um, coming from Delbert Piche or, or Piche, I'm sorry if I've, I've lost the accent there. What are the signs that your child is a bully? And this is a good question to ask. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, that's a very good question. And it's not always easy to tell. Um, I think, you know, if your child is bragging about um, their role in the school, if they're talking about things that they're doing to other kids that are making them feel bad, if they're making fun of other kids and mocking them, um, you know, those are things, if you see aggressive behavior, mm -hmm. those are things that you need to pay attention to. Those could to. be the alarm bells. Valerie Willat, this is a question that I think you're well suited to answer. Chris uh, Tatterin is asking on Facebook, uh, were the recent findings of one in three students facing Facing violence really surprising to you? Were you expecting the number to be higher or lower? Uh, anything well, like that? That's yeah. a question we put to five different experts, both mm -hmm. in the US and Canada, who are specialized in childhood violence, and they were not particularly surprised. Uh, they said that that's pretty much the prevalence that they see in the populations that they study, but they thought that our study had value because it really brought together Canadian students for a full, holistic, exhaustive survey, and that had value to them. So what was surprising was how comprehensive the responses we were hearing mm -hmm. from the students were. Um, 
Mary Allen is asking, uh, is bullying addressed in the Education Act? And that is a thing that differs province to province, territory to territory. But is bullying, uh, to either of you, something that's in the law? Not to my knowledge. What kids will tell you is that programs come into the school. It may be a one-time program. Um, the information isn't really resonating with them. They're not really getting what they need from those programs. So when we asked ministries and departments of education Canada-wide if they defined violence or violent behavior, because mm -hmm. that's what our experts were telling us, is maybe don't use the umbrella word of bullying, maybe go towards specific aggressive or violent behavior. We found that six out of the 13 provinces and territories did not define it clearly in the Education Act. Mm -hmm. And so that also makes it difficult to track or to count these cases. I think that, I, I hope that answers the question. There's also, the, you know, in Ontario, the whole idea of a cell phone ban has been repeatedly discussed. Is the idea that a cell phone ban in classrooms, is there any thought that it's there to reduce bullying? Uh, of course, that cell phone ban is only in classrooms as opposed to outside where we've seen a number of fights being recorded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, go yeah, <laughs> in, uh, in the story for the in the story I filed for the National mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, we, we did a lot of vis visual research to find these fights, and what really shocked me was how easy it had been for There's us on social media it, yeah. to just find fights, fights mm -hmm. outside, even fights inside the schools, and fights that were quite violent. As and well. what you see is people who are filming it. You don't see people who are intervening in it necessarily. Absolutely, and and that's a really important point because as well as teaching kids to talk about it when it's happening and to them, it's really important for kids that are observing, not necessarily participating, but standing by and watching. It's important for them to tell somebody as well. Kim Dunfield asking out of uh, Dauphin, uh, I presume Dauphin, Manitoba, uh, where they ha they're having an issue with um, one of the school boards in that area. How, how can they have something like that investigated? Who would they call? If something were happening in a school, well, I think you would go up through the ladder. So mm -hmm. the school trustees, the director of education, um, and if not, then you're going to talk to your local MPPs because mm -hmm. um, school boards are, are uh, responsible to the provinces. So somebody needs to be accountable. And I know in your own search for answers over many, many months, you began often at the school level, went up to the school board or school district, and and kept going and going. Eventually yeah. the ministry. Uh, but I would also tell these parents that if they want answers, maybe they can ask for numbers. Ask for the figures. Ask your school or your school board or maybe your trustees. Mm -hmm. Show us the numbers. What are you compiling? What are your statistics? And I think there's a lot of accountability to be had there. That's a data journalist for you. There's <laughs> someone who goes right back to the numbers and said, chase those. The answers are there. Uh, many more questions still coming in. Um, uh, let me uh, take one here from Sue McIntyre on Facebook. Do you think that smaller community schools handle violent incidents in a, in a better way or in a worse way? Any sense on that? Does, it, does the size of a school matter? It's hard to know. It's, it's possible that it does because larger schools with more students, it may be difficult to have as much of an understanding of what's going on. In smaller schools, the communities may be more involved, but um, you know, I think these problems happen in all schools. And when it came to tracking, we actually saw that phenomenon happen. We were asking 76 public school boards in Ontario to give us their data on school violence. And what we found was that the smaller school boards were actually better at releasing data mm -hmm. and better at organizing it, perhaps because it's less of a puzzle and it's easier for them to keep track of it. And if they're more open about it, then they're... they're they they're, were. Well, they're confronting their own challenges and everywhere is going to have challenges. Uh, you know, here's a, an interesting thing, a, a comment from Mary Ellen Lang on Facebook. Uh, I taught in BC high schools for more than 30 years and we were told to follow a WIT strategy, W-I-T-S. Here's what it is. W, walk away. I, ignore. T, talk it out with the bully. And S, seek support from an adult. Personally, I always thought this strategy was counterproductive and backwards. Your thoughts, Karen? Yeah, it's very difficult for a child to walk away, especially if they're in a situation where there's multiple children involved. Um, ignoring it is never, ever a good solution because it's not going to stop if you ignore it. Um, and we can't expect kids that are being victimized to talk to the person they're victimizing on their own without adults helping. So I would agree with the, with the caller. I don't think that that is necessarily an effective strategy. Although Curiously, in the survey, we asked people specifically about what kind of solution. 
Yeah, what kind of solution? And, and, and just right now, as you were reading this, it made me think about a child, a teenager that I interviewed, Taza de Luna, when he was explaining, describing the event where he mm. was physically assaulted at school. The first thing he said was, I tried to walk away. I tried to get help. I tried to just have a conversation with those kids. And, and it didn't work. It didn't work. He was yeah. eventually brutally assaulted. Um, another question, uh, this coming from Peter Hitchcock on Facebook. Do you think violence on TV contributes to violence in schools? It's possible. I think, you know, there's so many ways that kids are exposed to violence mm -hmm. um, these days. But I think what's really important is to look at what's actually going on with that individual child, the child that is committing that behavior. Um, because we often see, and I think one of the stories this week told us that a child who was acting as a bully was also experiencing a lot of distress in his home life. Mm. So I think that it's not, it's, it's too simple an answer to say it's TV. I think there's many factors that come into play. Uh, Glenn Ringrose from Manitoba asking on Facebook, why can people not get the RCMP involved or the police, or whatever jurisdiction you might be in, an assault is an assault? Absolutely, and there are times when the police definitely should be involved, and they can always be consulted as well, even if the school isn't sure. Um, but if, if the child is of an age that they can be held responsible for a criminal act and they've cr uh, committed an assault, then absolutely the police should be involved. Diana Lockie, we've got your question. I'm just going to go to Darlena Harris on Facebook quickly. First, do you think that more kids uh, and parents need to speak out in order to put a stop to this? Lots of kids fear for their life, and we've certainly seen hundreds and hundreds of uh, emails coming in in response to this and some yeah. of them are heartbreaking stories and that's we're hearing from hundreds of canadians across the country since our stories started airing and a lot of them are sharing a lot of them are really young and they're sharing stories that are either happening right now or happened just a few years ago um, teenagers who quit school dropped out of school were transferred are still suffering serious mental health issues as a result of this bullying uh, Diana Lock Lockie's question, is this really a school issue or is it a responsibility for parents? It's a responsibility for everyone, for the community, for the school, for the parents. I think parents need to be asking schools, what is your policy around how you're going to handle violence? What, if this happens to my child, what can I expect from you as a school? Mm -hmm. And I think the schools need to have those conversations with parents about this is what we expect from our students when they're in school. But I think it's an issue that no one system can tackle. It needs to be everybody. Monica Robertson uh, has a, a comment that I think uh, should be addressed by both of you. Um, thank you for addressing this issue. I worked in schools for 20 years and it is a huge problem that for generations has been swept under the carpet, ignored and underplayed by staff. Uh, thanks very much for Monica for, for sending this in. She says it's a huge hot button issue if someone tries to address it. One of the biggest issues I found was that there's a massive culture towards not being a tattletale. Yeah, and we, in our prevention programs, we teach kids the difference between telling and asking for help. Um, telling as, a, as, to, as in tattling and asking for help. And every child has a right to be safe. They have a right to go to school and not be fearful that they're going to be harmed. So when somebody is, is experiencing that, they need to be able to tell. And in our own survey, we saw so many students who just don't come forward. and. Exactly, you know, and I maybe think that not was, comfortable. Yeah, and I think to uh, the researchers we showed these figures to, that was one of the most shocking things, is that half of the children we surveyed told us they were victims of violence, but mm -hmm. they never said anything to school officials. And that's quite shocking. And we're also seeing underreporting on the part of teachers as well. Recent surveys have found the exact same things. So it's, it's concerning in a way that the numbers are so low, but it's also part of the explanation is that teachers and students don't feel comfortable speaking out. Emily Noel is asking a question on Facebook. If a parent were to be on a playground and witnessed an act of bullying during school hours, is there a way for the parent to intervene if no one at all is helping without there being a legal repercussion? Um, you know, I think yeah. very clearly you can't use physical separation. You can't physically intervene. That, uh, that would probably be high risk. I'm no lawyer, but that would seem to be. But if you're a parent and you're, you're let's say you're volunteering, I don't know the specific case for you, Emily, but if you're in a playground and it's a 
it's a public playground or if you're volunteering at a school and there's nobody else there to intervene, what can someone do to address bullying? Well, I think you can try to stop it by talking to the kids. I wouldn't recommend getting involved physically or trying to separate kids, but I think that you can tell them to stop, you can tell them the behavior is not appropriate, and then I would suggest that you need to get an adult from the school, if it is a school playground, mm -hmm. to become involved at that point. No. Um, uh, Tess Pill asking on uh, Facebook, if you can comment on why a restorative practice such as sitting down with a bully and victim is not a good idea. You talked a bit about that, but maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, and for some kids it might be the right thing to do, but it's usually not the first place to start. I think mm -hmm. we have to absolutely be sure that the, the child that's being victimized is comfortable and has support and feels that um, that's not going to put them at further risk. I think also the, the purpose is not to shame the bully or um, necessarily even to punish, but to understand what's going on. So there needs to be conversations with both children and both sets of parents that are held first before those kinds of meetings can occur. Valerie Willette, you've done so much work on this. Your, your thoughts, just as we're closing out here, on some of the most profound stuff from the data that you had to go through. I think I have to say, you know, the underreporting that half of the children we surveyed were victims and did not feel comfortable to speak out for whatever reason, and then that those who did still weren't satisfied with the result. I think that's very telling. Uh, Chantel uh, Morve, uh, this is going to have to be our last question on Facebook, but we're certainly uh, quite keen to take your comments. Um, you'll see that on cbcnews.ca on the main site. It's an opportunity to send in a message to us. We're getting hundreds of them. It'll take us a while to go through them, but we will indeed go through all of them. Chantel is asking, what are the numbers for children with disabilities bu uh, being bullied? Were those numbers looked at? And I don't think we looked specifically about um, whether uh, children who live with uh, a disability um, were, we didn't separate that out, but we did look at things like name calling and... and yeah, we did know. look at things like name calling, um, you know, racist comments or homophobic mm -hmm, comments. Mm -hmm. So that's all in our survey. Um, and that was something also that our researchers commented on was how exhaustive and comprehensive those questions were. Um, and, and those are questions that we're not necessarily asking kids every day. I know that for Ontario, if it helps, there is data that is compiled specifically uh, towards what you mentioned. Okay. I'd uh, like to thank you for all your questions. It's impossible for us to get through them all, but please do uh, interact at cbcnews.ca. You see many of the stories that we've done through the course of this week, um, and some of those are going to be continuing through the weekend and into next week as we unveil a lot of this survey. Um, the results for 4,000, more than that, young people aged 14 to 21, a survey designed with child psychologists and others to really get the tone and nature of those questions right. Uh, thanks so much for your questions and thank you to Valerie Ouellette, a data journalist uh, here at CBC who has spent months pouring through this information, interacting with boards that were very often reluctant to give up that information, uh, and Karen Kennedy um, with the Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Center. Thanks so much for your thoughts on this and thanks uh, once again to you for your questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're just oh. going to hang tight for a second. Okay. But, um, okay. yeah, those were, I, I mean, I think a lot of important questions.